Dr. Ben Carson with us. Okay, doctor, welcome aboard. Thank you for coming back on the air. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, you haven't announced that you're going to run. We certainly hope you are. There's a lot of crises going on. And, you know, I do realize there's the ice. ISIS crisis, the others, but you know what, what crisis I want to talk about? You mentioned in talking with CPAC, when you were on CPAC, that you retired. Yeah. And I think there's a terrific crisis, a retirement crisis, that nobody's talking about. And especially if you think about it, the number of people, the amount of people, about 36% of our workers have less than $1,000 to be used for retirement. 60% of our workers have less than 25000 The 401k mutual fund that thing has turned out to be a disaster. The fees eat most of your funds up. If you are president, what would you do with fixing this situation with retirement? Well, there's no question that it is a very serious problem, and, and there's no quick fixes for it. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to start de-emphasizing to people that the responsibility for their retirement uh, starts early on. Uh, you're in your 20s, and you start planning for it then, and we've totally gotten away from that. So what do we do with those who are already, uh, you know, beyond that point? Uh, one of the things is we learn how to pool resources. And I, I talk about this in, in uh, One Nation, that book, uh, of how some of the uh, retirement communities uh, are going to have to proliferate, which allow people to share facilities uh, and resources, and that cuts the price down to a manageable size. Uh, it, it may mean that you don't get everything immediately that you want when you want it, but you still will have access to it. And I think that's going to have to be the stopgap measure until such time as, you know, we reinstill the sense of personal responsibility for your own retirement. Yeah, and I believe a lot of that should go back to the school, still educating our kids that they should be responsible. But there's so many people, when we had the pension system, and the deal was, I'm the employer, I'll make sure, I'll take care of you, I'll take your your care of your retirement, you take care of me and you produce a great product. That was very good. The 401k, when that came in, that really wasn't a retirement fund. And I want you to listen to this for a moment. Responsibility begins and ends with our partners and our shareholders, and that's it. And that's the problem with Wall Street. The fact that there's no fiduciary relationship, and we've tried to get a fiduciary relationship, but they, again, the 401k mutual fund group, they just have too many lobbyists, they're just too strong. And every year it gets worse with this 401k. And I remember when Bush was talking about letting us have more of our own money so that, yeah. that we can do it, so it's not caught in that. 401k, which is, again, a, a disaster, and I think a, a full uh, it's a Ponzi scheme, if anything. It is. Now, now there are some, some employers who really do have excellent retirement programs, so we don't want to put them all in the same basket. But, but the bottom line is you know, people themselves are going to have to start thinking about this. And the other thing we have to do, and, and we've, we've really gotten away from the whole concept of, of family, responsibility mm -hmm. you know we have we have responsibility to our family if you have elderly parents and uh, and they're not doing well you should feel an obligation to take care of them they they took care of you when you were young and maybe they have been uh, less responsible than they should have been but they're still your parent you should still honor them and we, we we need to come back to the whole concept of strength that lies within the american family throwing that away is throwing away a lot I get so annoyed when I keep hearing this race card, race card. Did, didn't we elect the president? He's black. We elected him. I voted for him the first time. It, it is rather uh, absurd, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people who bring it up the most seem to be the, the progressives. Uh, they seem to feel that if you're black, you have to think a certain way. And, uh, you know, if you don't think that way, you know, you're an Uncle Tom, a sellout, or this or that or the other. I don't think they ever really stop and think about how racist that is. To, to actually say that you have to think this way because you belong to a certain ethnic group. That's absurd. Yeah. And the other, the other one that gets me is <laughs> they say, well, why would you even be thinking about, you know, running for, you know, high public office 
because Obama has ruined it for black people for the next many generations. What a, what a ridiculous statement. He's half white. Has he ruined it for all the white people, too? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. That's crazy. And I love what you just said. He's black. Well, I'm black. i got to go along with him. You know who does that all the time? Juan Williams. Listen to this. He drives me nuts. We're approaching the stretch run of the midterm elections. Unemployment is down, as we saw on Friday. Stocks are up. I think that uh, the United States is, you know, health care, Obamacare, not working as a campaign issue for the Republicans. I think if you go even beyond that, uh, we're in the Middle East fighting ISIS in the way the Republicans suggested. So you're saying this is all politics? Well, I think it's, it's, there's no GOP wave. It's a very close election. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> What's your take on that? Well, well, my take is that, you know, one of the big problems that we have uh, today in this nation is that you have so many people who cast everything in a political sphere. Things right. that have nothing to do with politics. They have to do with America. And, and what we really need to do, all of us, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, we need to look at issues that are pro-America and anti-America, not Republican, not Democrat. And we allow ourselves to be manipulated. You know, you take a perfect example, the IRS scandal, an agency of the government being used to persecute the enemies of the administration. That is a constitutional emergency. And yet we've allowed it to be framed as a partisan issue. That's crazy. Yeah, and and again, what, what drives me out of my mind is when we talk about Holder, and they're talking about the black issue with him. And I'm going, no, I don't hate him because he's black. I don't like the guy because he never prosecuted one banker. And his law firm, Covington, represents Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Goldman Sachs. And he gives these guys every break. They never pay. The, when we hear about, oh, they just got fined uh, uh, $25 million, we know they only got fined a quarter of that. And they didn't even pay that. The shareholders did. I am really upset that they never went, a holder never went after these banks. If you were president, you yeah. had your attorney general, and, and let's say the, the uh, uh, statute of limitation wasn't up, would you at least investigate these banks? Of course. Of course. You know, um, you know the current administration, you know, Obama, they talked about how, how evil those people were until they got in office. And then, you know, they're, they're the biggest sources of, you know, fundraising. That's craziness. Everybody should be held to the same rules in our nation. It doesn't matter what their social status, what their economic status is. And in, in cases where wrongdoing not only occurred but hurt millions of people, there's just no way that should be ignored. Yeah, and, and, and when he comes on, he says something like this, Holder. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions – becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to um, to prosecute them when we are hit with indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. Now, when he says that, and then Obama comes on and says there's not a smidgen of corruption at the IRS, I only go back and think about the, the, the saying, we, you know, you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. I think they can. I think they really believe they can. <laughs> I, I think they have uh, underestimated the, uh, the intellect of the populace, and I think that they will pay the price for that. I think people are waking up. I see it every place I go, all over the country. It's actually very encouraging. I'm, I'm quite anxious to see what the pundits are going to be saying on November the 5th. But the next two years, I'm very concerned about. People say he's only got two years left, but that's a lifetime in politics. Aren't you concerned? I, I'm very concerned with a president who is issuing executive orders and a Senate leader who sits there and blocks the will of the people by not bringing things to vote, which have been passed by the House. He's got over 350 bills, pocket vetoed, sitting on his desk. That is basically saying to the people, we don't care what you think. And uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, my wife and I wrote the book, you know, One Vote, uh, so that people can find out what the heck is going on and become responsible voters. If the people 
become informed voters. This kind of stuff will not be going on. Wow. And, and we just uh, hope that you announce that you're going to run, and we'd be so delighted, and I'd love to have you tell us now you would. <laughs> but I know that's not going to happen, but aside that, you're a good friend of the show. We, we enjoy having you on, and we really hope that you do throw your hat in the ring, because we think you, uh, you'd, you'd be terrific. You really would. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, and I appreciate all the people. You know, I'm in the airport today. There's so many people gathered around me getting photographs and autographs. The, the pilot came out and said, what's going on? And then he said, oh, could I have a picture? <laughs> you know what? They're reaching out to you, doctor. They're reaching out. Listen, thank you very much for coming on the air. And Absolutely. we'll keep reaching out to you in the future and get you back on. We have so much to talk about. Thank you. There thank you go. You. That's Dr. Ben Carson.